So in this video, we're going to analyze the patch of the vulnerability and we're going to start thinking about strategies to exploit this vulnerability. The key points of how this vulnerability works are that some resource manager that is recovering will be unlocked in order to queue a notification structure to userland, basically related to the, the enlistment. And so the code that is actually looping into this vulnerable function retains a pointer to a K enlistment structure that might be freed. And so there is no lock held for that enlistment despite the pointer being held. And so it sends a notification about the enlistments that will be potentially freed, which will be useful later to know what structure the kernel is actually talking to, since we will be able to retrieve it from userland. So it attempts to do a race condition type check, but fails to do so, which makes it prone to a race condition. The code drops the reference count of the k enlistment object which contributes to it being able to be freed and so what happens is that it might end up using this pointer that points to memory that is now freed so let's analyze how they patched it now that hopefully you have a rough idea of what this code is doing you will realize that the patch is fairly easy to understand and so basically most of the code is the same before and after the patch but the difference now is that in the patched code on the right, they completely removed the check for whether or not the enlistment was finalized. But now instead, what we see is when you enter the if condition related to sending a notification at all, it will just always reference the next enlistment from the very start of the enlistment head. And so actually this is quite inefficient code now because it is consistently reworking the list of enlistments from the beginning over and over each time it queues a notification for one enlistment. And the last thing they've done is they've added some code and this may indicate why they added this additional logic check, which basically tries to see whether or not the transaction manager has suddenly gone offline. And if so, it will just exit the loop in a new way that it never used to do because there was no such code to exit the loop early before. And so one thing that is interesting about this extra check is that before we understood why it was doing this check for the transaction manager being offline, we thought that it may mean that you have to put the transaction manager offline in order to trigger the condition where the enlistment was freed and then trigger the user to free. So it was actually confusing in that sense. So yeah, basically Microsoft entirely removed the racy bad if condition check on the finalized flag that you could abuse to win the race condition and trigger use after free. So with all of that understanding, I guess it is pretty interesting to see how Kerspersky explained this vulnerability. And the first time we exploited this vulnerability, that is the only information we had in our hand. And so I would advise you to pause this video and just read that slide first before you, before you go further and try to make sense of its contents. So yeah, basically Kaspersky found this zero day exploited in the wild, which is why this vulnerability got fixed and why we ended up exploiting it. And we built this course for you to attend. And to be honest, I don't expect you to really make sense of these two paragraphs entirely because in the course of writing this exploit, we probably read these two paragraphs a hundred times for it to actually make sense. So I think it's worth actually reading with you the actual two paragraphs. So basically Kaspersky's analysis of how to exploit this vulnerability is this. To abuse this vulnerability exploit first creates a name pipe and opens it for read and write. And at that time we had no idea why the name pipe was created or not. It is just okay the exploit does that so maybe it is interesting. Then it creates a pair of new transaction manager objects, resource manager objects, transaction objects and creates a big number of enlistment objects for what we will call transaction 2. So when we read that, we didn't know what these objects were and stuff. So this is why we created this little Visual Studio project ourselves in order to play around. We figured we would probably need all of these objects. And once we understood the patch, it made sense why you need all a bunch of all enlistment objects because you are trying to win a race condition while being in this while loop. And the KTM lab you should have done before reaching this video represent this kind of work we did when trying to exploit this vulnerability. 
And so it says, enlistment is a special object that is used for association between a transaction and a resource manager, which we now know. Then when the transaction state changes, associated resource manager is notified by the KTM, which again, we described previously. After that, it creates one more enlistment object only now. It does so for transaction one and commits all the changes made during this transaction. This part didn't really make sense and I still don't like their explanation anyway, but you know, it gives some hints. Then it says, after all the initial preparation have been made, exploit proceeds to the second part of the memory trigger. It creates multiple threads and bind them to a single CPU core. So that actually, you know, is indicative of a race condition if you've ever done it. Then it continues with one of the created threads calls NT query information resource manager in the loop. We didn't know exactly why that is, and you don't know why yet either, but we'll actually explain it later. While the second thread tries to execute NT recover resource manager once, we know why, because it is trying to race in this while loop in a TM recover resource manager, but the vulnerability itself is triggered in the third thread. This thread uses a trick of execution NT query information thread to obtain information on the latest executed syscall for the second thread. This information didn't make any sense to us at first. We didn't know why. Also, this part made us guess that Kaspersky didn't really understand how the exploit worked anyway, because saying that the thread that does that is the one that triggers the vulnerability is kind of misleading and almost wrong. And then it says, successful execution of NT recovery resource manager will mean that the race condition has occurred which is also technically not entirely true. And further execution of write file on previously created name pipe will lead to memory corruption, which is also kind of misleading. And so the point here is basically like, sometimes you have a little bit of information from other researchers and the Kaspersky guys are, are smart, really. They reversed this exploit. They provided a working proof of concept, apparently to Microsoft in order for them to replicate. However, their explanation is quite bad to really understand what is happening. And in many cases, it threw us off down like incorrect rabbit holes, but it shows how complicated the vulnerability actually is and how hard it is to exploit it and for people to understand the exploitation techniques too. But I guess the main reason I take the time to read this too is when you are reading people's papers, or blogs, and you're trying to follow along the exploits that other people have written and explained, and you're trying to replicate it yourself, it is worth being skeptical of the information you are reading and don't assume that you are getting something wrong. Because a lot of the time it is not your fault, but it, it is somebody else's fault. So now that we have read the vague explanation of Kaspersky of the vulnerability, and we have a good understanding of the vulnerability, we can get an idea on approximately how we would approach exploiting it and what we would need to do. So the idea is that after the check for the finalized flag has occurred, we want to free that enlistment, which means we need to know what enlistment we want to free, which is something we would add to our checklist of things to figure out. And then before the code is able to lock the resource manager's mutex, our plan would be to somehow replace what used to be the enlistment memory with data that we control so that basically the next same RM flink pointer will be controlled by us. And this is so far from actually getting something like code execution in the kernel or privilege escalation. But due to the type of the bug, this would be where you would have to start anyway. And just tr triggering that simple behavior will teach you a lot about the constraints around, around that vulnerability and how to then get new ideas to build better primitives. And so basically what this looks like is that the code will fail to detect that the enlistment is finalized. This will be user after free memory, which will access the next same RM flame pointer, which is potentially invalid. For instance, if the memory was replaced, and if the memory wasn't replaced and the chunk is just freed and it still holds the old enlistment data, actually it will just point to the next K enlistment and the loop will just keep running safely. But depending on circumstances, it might generate a blue screen of death and crash the kernel. So the main ideas to think about in the background, once you have an understanding of, of, of vulnerability like this, 
uh, how to go about exploiting it and what can you abuse giving latest mitigation, assuming you want to target something like the latest Windows 10. And so the main thing based on the Windows 10 1809 mitigations is that there is no SMAP, like supervisor mode access privileges, which means that if we can replace the KN instrument being used after freed and we can replace its next same RM fling pointer, we could technically point it to userland. And what that means is that we can have this loop point to a new crafted enlistment list made of fake K enlistment structures entirely in New Zealand, at which point we control everything that the kernel will be looking at when continuing the loop, all the pointers, all the flags, everything. And maybe there is something in that while loop that lets us abuse it to eventually get an arbitrary read or write primitive, which is kind of the end goal of this types of vulnerabilities.